Well, hello, everybody. So uh, so my name is Chris Minney. I am the content manager and director of website development for Gold Biotechnology. I want to thank everybody who's logged in and is watching uh, watching our panel. So Gold Bio is a supplier of proven published and affordable reagents and chemicals for research labs and small businesses all over the world. We specialize in, in thousands of day-to-day -day reagents that you need for the lab, but at affordable rates, you can discover more. Check out our website for all of our products at goldbio.com. So our webinar today is a panel discussion entitled Setting Up a New Lab. With me are five panelists with a wide variety of expertise in science and different fields uh, to give everyone some great advice on getting your lab going as painlessly as possible. Uh, so if I can start some introductions. So uh, right, uh, I don't know where we're, well, let's start with Dr. Torrance Gill. Torrance Gill is a uh, assistant professor at Chouin University. Do you wanna introduce yourself, Torrance? Sure. Um, I'm currently assistant professor in the Department of Biology uh, at Chihuahua University. Um, this is a really small university, has about uh, the maximum of 1,500 students. So most of the class sizes are pretty small. Right. Um, my background is I'm, um, I'm a molecular entomologist. So as a, I mean, I love insects and um, all of my students know that. So I emphasize that a lot in my courses. Um, so I did my PhD in the University of Kentucky. Um, I've done postdocs in the USDA and the University of Florida. Um, and during that time, I did a lot of research, but um, I really have a passion for teaching. So I got uh, into teaching at the University of Stetson University, so a smaller school in Florida. And that's where I started um, teaching at small colleges. And then I finally landed this position last year. So this is my first full year at Chowan University. Um, well, very cool. So, All yeah. Right. Well, welcome welcome to the panel. Uh, cool. Next, we have Tro Simos. Uh, he is a lab manager at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Troy, how are you doing? Good. Uh, yeah, so my name is uh, Troy Simos. I am uh, actually got my master's degree at the University of Colorado Anschutz. Um, and I was got, just got employed at the University of Colorado Boulder as a lab manager of two labs. Uh, basically, they're in the same area. Brand new labs. Uh, I started back in March, and basically when I came in, there was nothing there. Oh, wow. So, yeah, and this is actually my first time as a lab manager, so I'm very, I'm the newbie, really. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. And we have Dr. Jeremy Bird. Uh, Jeremy is an assistant professor at the University of Delaware. Hi, how are you? Hi. Yeah. Um, thanks for the introduction. So, yeah, I just started this past January um, as an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Delaware. Um, so, uh, a, a mid-sized R1 level school. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, before that, I, I did my PhD at Cornell University um, and my postdoc at Rutgers University, where I kind of transitioned from a postdoc um, into a research associate position for a few years. Um, where I became a de facto lab manager um, for the lab that I worked in um, before obviously being able to get a faculty position. So yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. Again, welcome everybody. And we have Dr. Fanny Yoon uh, from the Green Gear Labs. How are you? Great. Thank you so much for inviting me. Awesome. Yeah, so I have a long history in uh, academic as well as industrial R&D labs and pilot plants um, in chemistry, chemical engineering, and biotechnology. Um, but recently we started GreenYourLab.org, which is a nonprofit trying to encourage um, green lab movements. So trying to tell scientists as well as in, when they're doing the lab setup, as well as when they're doing their experiments, to look at sustainability as, a, as an important factor in the work they're doing. And so um, we have a free network for anybody who wants to come and join us to chit chat and get some advice about how to green your lab. Uh, go to greenyourlab.org and uh, we're happy to have you. Awesome. Excellent. Well, thank you again for joining us. And then finally, we have Dr. Eric Samuels. Eric is back. He has done one of our webinars before. If you guys have, uh, have viewed any of our webinar series in the past, uh, Dr. Samuels is from the ph pharmaceutical manufacturer AbbVie. So welcome back, Dr. Samuels. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, yeah, my name, is, my name is Eric Samuels. I am uh, a scientist at AbbVie uh, Incorporated. Um, in Irvine, California, uh, used to be Allergan. Now we're very excited about that. 
Um, and uh, I'm in the analytical sciences, uh, which is part of the pharmaceutical sciences group um, in, in drug development here at AbbVie. Um, I have a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences where I studied um, mostly biochemistry and, and medicinal chemistry. Um, so both drug discovery and drug development, I've dabbled in both. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just very happy to be here. And uh, in fact, <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And I, and again, I want I really want to thank everybody for joining us uh, for this webinar, and thank everybody who's watching. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with some general questions for everybody. Uh, if anybody who is watching the webinar has either a general question uh, for the panel or a specific question for any one of our panelists, please feel free to send that to me in the chat, uh, along with is it is it for everybody or is it for somebody specific? And then I will. Um, be happy to work that uh, that question into the conversation for you guys. All right. Well, just to get everything started off, so um, around the room, what are some pitfalls that you guys have found starting up your labs that you'd like to warn some people about from your perspective? And you know, we have we have teaching labs, uh, we have industry labs, we have academics, and obviously we have uh, the uh, the green space, right? So what are what are your uh, what are some things that you'd warn some people to watch out for? Who wants to go first? Why don't, why, why don't, you want to go first? Sure, go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. So I find that uh, the biggest pitfall is not preparing for the future. So people often think when they're setting up a new lab that they're looking at what they're doing today or what they mm -hmm. need to be done today. How many the lab space for the members that they have today and not thinking about the future understood that lab space is expensive, uh, so you don't want to build your lab too big, but things like the flexibility in your lab. So if you look at labs from like the 60s to the 80s to the 2000s to today, those labs look very, very different, and your lab is going to be with you for a long time. So you really need to think about what your lab will be used for 20 years from today. Maybe in the past they were using more glassware and needed more bench space. Today, when you look at the lab, we have a lot of equipment, and therefore, if you're in an old lab, the elements are in the wrong place. So we think that in the future, we're going to see more blended science coming forward. So it will be things like working with other labs, but also chemists working with biologists. So you'll have like a chemistry biology lab or um, chemists working with robotics. So it becomes a chemical robotics lab. So really looking at lab flexibility is really important because it's going to be unsustainable if you think, do things like tear out entire sections of your lab because now you're doing something slightly different there. So we encourage people to kind of dream what your lab will look like, but still suit the needs of today and to build in that flexibility. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't really think about the the concept of the labs are joining forces now, huh? Yeah. Right. There's a lot of that going on these days. And it's starting, and, and we think it's going to become a lot more prevalent. Makes sense. Oh, that makes sense. So what's that, Torrance? I was just saying that makes uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Right. So, so what, what about, what about from an academic standpoint, or so a teaching lab situation? So what are some things that you've noticed starting up the lab there? Um, one thing you have to, to just do an evaluation of what is there first. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really, really important for the small schools because they're predominantly teaching first and research is a very small component of that. So you have to see what they use in the labs, what they use in the courses to teach with, because that's usually what you're going to be using in order to do your research with. So you right. kind of have to get those two things aligned together. So first thing I would say is see what they have, see what you actually really, really need or need for success. Um, and then you can start kind of pushing for some funding for one or a few items starting up. Right. So normally, uh, teaching places don't have startup funds either. Oh, so that, is, so that makes it so hard. Them. Yeah, but they do give you a lot of funding for the courses. So you have to think about what you want and kind of, you know, add it to a course when you're buying all the equipment for the course. Like, right. And it slowly increase what you what you need for the class. So. Huh. That is, that is a good, I guess, and and the other challenge with a small with a small university like that and a teaching university is that a lot of times you've got to have a lot of hats, don't you? Yes. Right. 
Yeah. Right. You can't just be a molecular cloning lab. You have to be a molecular cloning lab that also does cell culture every mm -hmm. once in a while and everything else. Right. Yeah. And some of the places, uh, like I'm kind of lucky that this small school has an actual greenhouse. So um, I was really, that was one of the really great selling points. And I thought I can do a lot of stuff here. Um, but uh, as you mentioned, a lot of hats because I teach also general biology. So the requirements for that course are different. So you can kind of squeeze in some equipment that you might want to use with students and research in the, in the future. So right on. anybody else got some ideas? The, the a lot of hats idea is actually a really good one because one of the, the things that I've yeah, been struggling to keep up with is the fact that there are so many different things that you have to do as a new mm. professor. Like, you, yeah, you're worrying about the courses that you're going to be teaching. You're worrying about getting equipment into the lab, recruiting students. And then once you have the students, like actually keeping them working. <laughs> so, and, and then, yeah, you, you'll have it committee assignments in terms of like, depending on what department you're in there. Yeah. So jobs outside of just doing that, and of course, even further outside things like reviewing papers that you'll be expected to do, grant writing. Um, and it's just a lot to juggle at once. And it's really worth taking the time to sit down and like hammer out, I'm going to spend X number of hours on this day doing this, you know, half an hour for this on this day and make sure yeah. that you really stick to a schedule like that. Cause if you don't do that, you will end up in a lot of trouble really quickly. Yeah. I can imagine. I imagine like for, for those of you guys who are like, you know, where the lab is yours, you're owning the lab. Uh, I imagine like one of the first things you kind of have to do is almost create like an outline of expectations, right? So the, these are the things that I expect to get done in a two week time period, a one month time period, a three month time period, right? Is if you don't have that kind of plan, like you said, you, you, it can easily get overwhelmed because I'm sure all everybody wants you to have everything running right now, right? The, the academic board wants your students enrolled. Um, the panel wants your lab already producing results, right? Uh, some, of the, you know, some of those things. So I imagine it, uh, it can get pretty stressful if you don't have some kind of outline to help you out. At the small teaching school, if you want to have a, a research program driven by undergraduates, you really have to focus on what you have in the teaching labs because mm. you're not going to actually have your own lab space. So, right. so like really finding out what's in there. Like mm. when I got to this place, there's so many really, really old equipment and the space, they have a lot of space, but there's junk on it. So, you know, you have to start clearing out um, so yeah, right. Like, trying to figure out what you have. I just finished doing an inventory and now I finally know what I have and that's a like, huge relief now. So <laughs> yeah, is this, you know, these kind of things take time to right. most of the summer to do it, but um, right, you're gonna have to do them. And, that, and that's you, you're, so you're coming into a lab that has been used before, right? So Troy, I know you were saying you came into basically a, a completely empty space. Yeah. Right. So that's a, uh, that's such a complete difference of perspective, right? Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> um, basically, I, but I, even though I did come in and there was a virtually nothing, there was like a couple of equipment, so a few glassware and stuff like that. But yeah, I kind of did the same thing. Uh, first, I had to take stock of what I had. It wasn't a lot, but I did take stock of what I had. And then we had to kind of build from there. And then, yeah, another big thing that we have to worry about is uh, yeah, just kind of planning ahead. A lot of the things we're missing now are just kind of common things normal to like every lab that we just forget about. So you just kind of have to, it's gonna be a work in progress, I think. But um, another thing I'd like to add that's a pitfall that just uh, kind of goes over the radar a little bit is uh, especially for academic labs, you have to worry about a lot of school policies and uh, keeping, keeping uh, up to date with a lot of uh, university policies, uh, mostly in regards to waste disposal and uh, other things like that, <laughs> like waste disposal, yeah, mostly waste disposal. But yeah, so you also have to build those into your lab. And in some places you have to kind of coordinate with the building manager to make modifications. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, things like that. 
Well, Eric, what, what's, what thoughts do you have from the industry side? Oh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I can definitely relate with everyone because um, when I was doing my PhD, uh, I did my PhD at UC Irvine. I don't know if I mentioned that, so right around the corner from where I currently am sitting. Um, but when I was doing my PhD, I, I, uh, one of the labs I joined was um, is a crystallography lab, the lab I did my, my dissertation in, and uh, it was a biochemistry lab, and me coming in as a, as a synthetic chemist uh, having to set up within that lab. So kind of like what Fanny was talking about where, where you're really merging labs together. And so starting entirely from scratch with, with essentially no help um, and, and borrowing equipment, everything from just glassware and, and rotovaps just to get off the ground. Um, and, and I had done that a lot previously because I came from a, a small teaching university for my master's. And so I, I definitely <laughs> relate to what Torrance is saying um, as well. Industry for our pitfalls, I mean, the lab was already here when I got here, mm -hmm. but um, I'd say a lot of it is is the maintenance, the lab maintenance, um, especially when you're talking, I'm going to talk specifically about uh, development. So you have the whole quality aspect to the labs. Um, the lab space has to be uh, a GMP compliant, which is good mm -hmm. manufacturing practices and, and uh, or good laboratory practices, which adds an additional layer of... Um, for lack of a better term, stress, I guess, onto people that are managing the labs. We have a whole group that, that manages uh, instruments, validates equipment, um, I mean, everything. And so doing, you have to remember that, that everything can be audited um, and, and that your goals are a little bit different. 95% of the work that I do is, is non-GMP, it's, it's development, research and development, but there are occasional times you know, where I need to do something that is GMP. And, and so our labs are all GMP. So, you know, something as like simple as moving, moving a piece of equipment involves a lot of steps and uh, everything needs to be calibrated at a specific time. And if it's not, it's out of compliance and, you know, you can't use it. I mean, you can use it, but not for a GMP task. Right. So there's a lot of other layers. You, you want to have an engineering group that, that comes in or a validation group that comes in and make sure that, you know, temperatures are up to, you know, you know, are followed on refrigerators and, you know, it, it's a very different way of thinking than academia than the way I thought in academia. Um, you know, I, and, I, and I spoke about this in the last seminar, you know, something as simple as, as using, using a pipette when you're doing GMP, you have to calibrate the pipette, make sure that it's, and these are things that you don't have to think about. So, so I think when you're building an, an industrial lab, uh, at least for development, not necessarily for discovery, but for development, um, there are these additional layers to think about that, that quality aspect. Right. Yeah. It's just so much, so much beyond, uh, the, the, what you would get in a, in a regular lab. Right. Well, so, so, so one of the questions I'm hearing, um, that, that came through is like, um, what is your, what is your guys' experience on negotiating bulk purchases with vendors? I, I have no stock in this relationship, but what, what's, What's uh what's your what's your experience with that? How do you do this? Well, I could go, yeah. So mostly I have basically to negotiate the prices. I I, I always reach out to uh, the vendor. We always have a contact with the vendor. Usually it's through the school. So I always reach out to the contact with the vendor. Um and then I usually I just talk with them. Uh, usually I ask for new lab pricing and things like that. Sometimes it's given, sometimes it's not. And certain vendors are much more difficult to work with than others and take some time. <laughs> I've never had problems hopefully, with gold bio. Ho hopefully, yeah, gold bio hopefully has never had that kind of problem. Yeah, never had problems with gold bio. Gold bio, gold bio. <laughs> <laughs> One of the best ones, but yeah. Uh, yeah, so that'll be, <laughs> that'll be part of the process, yeah. Right. And then how do you guys, how do you guys deal with like... Um, used equipment like so so how do you so you 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 come into a lab like torrance you're coming into a lab and it's obviously used equipment um how do you get it how do you get it where you know it's working right again like how do you yeah the the maintenance component here is a huge challenge here um yeah uh, right now the they don't want to invest in some of the older equipment because it's literally old and we're trying to, um, we're trying. I guess the university is trying to be um, to put funds toward upgrading. Mm -hmm. So when you have these huge shifts in 
in that kind of like, um, like the way the university is feeling about your department and they're going to throw money into it. Now is the time to replace things and right. fix things that you, you know, until then you're just basically putting kind of like tape on things. And um, that's, un that's an unfortunate component of a really smaller place because they're not as well-funded as other places are. Um, like I have incubators in my, in my lab that um, I cut one on once and it just starts making like these like like really weird noises. <laughs> oh, so no. I just cut it back off. I'm not a mechanic. So <laughs> um, so basically it's basically a it, we don't have the the money to fix those. Right. And um, then for yeah, oh, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You can you can go ahead. Well, I was gonna say so and then speaking of like, you know, sometimes you you're working with those older machines. Um Fanny, from from a standpoint of greening your lab, right? So when when do you cut your losses? When should you just go ahead and bite the bullet and get something that's a little bit more eco friendly and a lot, you know, a little bit easier on the budget all the way around? Yeah. So it highly depends on the piece of equipment, and it also depends on where your incentives are, right? So for example, buying a a new piece of equipment that's going to be more energy efficient is going to hit your costs when it comes to um, say the energy that you're like the money that you're saving. But on the other hand, that piece of equipment went through a huge life cycle to get to you, right? The, the extraction of the materials to uh, the transport to your lab. So in general, it's more sustainable to fix and reuse. And for um, Torrance, if I could suggest that there are um, people out there who will take your used lab equipment and try to fix it up and try to resell it. And um, mm -hmm. And uh, that might be a great place for you to take your equipment that you're not using anymore and for another lab to benefit from getting a cheaper piece of equipment. Um, and so, and also labs have, uh, sorry, suppliers also have things like less than perfect equipment. Um, so to save some money, you might also, when you're negotiating with your supplier to say, hey, you know, could I buy something that's slightly dented but doesn't affect safety, doesn't affect function, that just slightly dented or that you have sitting around that you can't sell and they'll be able to sell it to you for a cheaper price and right. therefore you've gotten that off their hands and been able to uh kind of benefit from that as well right and i imagine like some of the uh, you know some of the large universities i'm sure that they have like warehouses of old equipment i know the industry always has a warehouse of old equipment yep. how do you guys go about um uh, finding what is there like you know it's like I've worked, I worked for companies where there was an entire warehouse, but we had no idea what was in it. So how, how would you find some of that information out? Anybody? Yeah, I, it, for me, it, it's come down to our building manager. It has, I mean, fortunately we have a really fantastic building manager who knows where a lot of this stuff is and can point us to the rooms where it's like, yeah, go to town, take what you want, <laughs> um, that kind of thing. And yeah, you can get a lot of really useful things as long as you're willing to go with older stuff. I know, yeah, buying used equipment also can save a significant amount of money, but you do have to, yeah, the, there are pros and cons on that, as mentioned before. I recently got my lab a new FPLC um, that f fortunately was a hand-me-down from another lab that hadn't right. been using it for years and years. Um, but like looking at new versus used prices on those, a new one is in the range of fifty to $60,000. Wow. Um, where, yeah, like most of the used ones that come from these refurbishment companies are in the range of $30,000, but you might not necessarily be able to get the same kind of service contract. So for maintenance on those used ones anymore where you could, and so you kind of have to take that into account. So yeah, I picked up my used one and almost immediately found out that it had a significant fault that was, uh -huh. yeah, another like $7,000 out of my pocket. Oh. To get it fixed. Uh. So Right. Yeah, and these things just add up really, really quickly. So it, it's really worth, yeah, looking for both what the new options are. Because, yeah, negotiating with reps from companies, they want to sell you stuff, right? That's their job. And so they should be responsive to you. They should get back to you quickly with prices for things. But compare the used prices to the new ones. There's almost always um, used equipment companies like nearby most larger research universities um, or centers where you have a lot of like industry um, just because you know companies go out of business and their equipment gets surplus and sold to these folks um, so it's yeah 
it's worth asking around amongst your colleagues. Do right. they know reputable vendors? Just contact them, ask them. Don't be afraid to send emails. Um, it can also be a time sink having to do a lot of this, but um, it, it really ends up being worth it in the end because you can save yourself a lot of money. And right. you take your time a little bit, right? So um, if go into your lab thinking what pieces of equipment or what things do I need today, right? That I need to function today. What can I share with somebody for now or even permanently, right? right. Um, but, uh, you know, if, it, if, if it's something you've decided that your lab needs to have, but you, maybe you don't need it today. Maybe it's something that you can need a little bit later on and you can then, you know, take some time into sourcing that used piece of equipment because getting a used piece of equipment, you need to get the right piece, of course, as well as, um, you know, as well as making sure it, it doesn't always come on the market, right? And so you mm -hmm. need to wait a little bit. But um, yeah, so sharing with people permanently as well as sharing with people for a short period of time until you can get your equipment. Right. And I imagine, uh, I, I mean, uh, pretty much across the board, like no matter where you guys are at, no matter what field you're at, you, there is a, there's probably a lot of opportunity for shared equipment, right? There's shared space, there's like, right? In almost all of your labs or all of your institutes, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does depend slightly from school to school and place to place. I worked at a national lab where you couldn't easily share. Mm. You had to go through some other procedures to reapp it and then you could get it. But uh, in school scenarios, um, there's usually either core facilities or shared uh, equipment that you can, that if you ask either the building manager or one of the program coordinators, they can put you to calendars where you can schedule that kind of stuff. At least in my experience. I know, I know yeah, in the that's... UK and in the US, there is a national list of uh, equipment that you can that you can borrow at different institutes. And there's also a booking for that as well. So if you have a piece of equipment that you don't have, you can go onto those national lists and uh, maybe, I mean, you might have to travel. Maybe you have to send your samples over to get them tested. Um, but uh, there is equipment that is nationally uh, available. Nice. All right. Or, or facilities are, are very, very useful resources mm -hmm. when you're in uh, academia. Any, even in industry, I mean, we collaborate with all sorts of different groups. Um, you know, if we need something run on, you know, it, it's, it's a giant collaboration in industry. So we're kind of jumping around. But for us to go and, you know, for somebody to come in and use our equipment, um, there's an extra step because, you know, just going into a GMP lab um, is a little bit different but I you know I have non-GMP space so for example on the on the primary on, on, on our NMR instrument here on, on site and so people want to use the NMR instrument they just ask and I'm yeah sure go ahead you know we have somebody who maintains it and um, you know don't break it it's expensive <laughs> right um, but yeah things like that you know we, there's always somebody you can go to um, and when I was in graduate school we have a core facility um, for mass spec and that was very useful I actually just donated um, a couple of instruments to that facility from, from here on site that weren't being used. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another thing is look at sometimes industry will, will donate equipment um, to academic labs. Um, a lot of time, I know when I was in my master's, we had an NMR um, that was donated from, from uh, uh, it was donated by Amgen actually. And, um, and that was really that was really neat. And they had they had cameras set up so that other universities could see how it ran and everything like that. So oh, that's cool. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so there are there are industrial you know industrial labs that will donate equipment that they don't use anymore. Wow. So so who so if you're an academic lab, how would you find how would you find those people? Um, how would you find that out? Yeah. So you can always find online. Um, you could put your name in. I'm actually trying to, I was trying to with our, because with the merge and everything, it was a little bit different. Um, for us, the way the process worked initially was that we would, you know, just find, you know, if, if somebody needed something. Um, but I think that, uh, and, and it was always local, um, but for, for AbbVie as a whole, um, I think that it's something that would definitely be useful you know, to be, to implement like, Hey, you know, universities can just throw their names out there and say, Hey, right. Um, yeah. And I know that's some, in some industry, I don't think we currently do it right now, but, uh, it's something. Okay. That... All right. So I would, I would definitely be interested in something like that. <laughs> yeah. Sure. 
Yeah, I will also say that I know the NIH does a similar program to that. So they have a huge warehouse of older equipment and the way that the labs are set up at the NIH main campus, um, like basically they're retiring perfectly good equipment all the time. Um, and so, yeah, folks yeah, from smaller schools and things can schedule, or at least pre-COVID could schedule time to go to their warehouses and actually look through what they had available. And basically, if you were able to carry it out and, and drive it away, like you were welcome to take the stuff. And so I know a lot of my colleagues in the department have very nice fluorescence microscopes and things like that, that they were able to get through that program that saved them, yeah, hundreds of thousands of dollars um, by yeah. being able to, yeah. And of course, you know, you, you don't necessarily know what actually is available at a given time, but it is worth going to find things. I mean, even smaller lab equipment, rotating platforms, things like that. Right. But, you know. Yeah, I will, I will see every so often because um, especially being so close to San Diego, there's a lot of startups. So if you're, if you're near a, a biotech hub, there's a lot of like startups that'll, you know, sometimes unfortunately go belly up and then they'll have a bunch of equipment that they're getting rid of. And uh, you can get that very, very cheap. I know that government websites, uh, I think there's a government website that where they'll get rid of, you know, certain national labs will be getting rid of equipment as well. Right. Uh, I've just seen through the grapevine. Right, right. So, so again, it sounds like uh, a lot of times, so like if you have a good building manager, that's a primary source, right? So find your building manager or, or whoever is in charge of that, because those guys probably do have a lot of contacts uh, having done this before. Like centralized facilities can be very good. So I know at UC Boulder, at least some of the labs there have kind of centralized freezer facilities. So mm -hmm. they kind of put all their freezers in one room that helps them build like, because the freezer, you know, um, has a lot of exhaust heat with it. And so they build a better, more efficient um, kind of system to remove the heat. And then also then because people are sharing freezers, um, then that means that not everybody has to buy their own freezer. You could just get a little, you can, I think maybe uh, Troy can talk a little bit more about that, but you can actually rent spaces in these freezers that you see Boulder, they have a system for that um, so that you don't have to buy your own freezer. Yeah, there is that system, not so much in my building, sadly, but yeah, I know there is that system and there's a lot more core facilities where everything is shared. So you just kind of go, in fact, in ours, we have a tissue culture core where everyone can just go to do tissue culture. And it's actually very, um, it saves a lot on resources. Right. But yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, so, uh, so very specific question for, uh, for Eric, um, which is, is there any advice for moving a small industry lab into a larger space? Like, how do you start planning for that? A small industrial lab into a larger space. Um, it, it really depends on the kind of lab um, mm -hmm. and what kind of regulations you need behind it because, you know, industry is a little bit different because with, you know, EHNS, depending on what city you're in. And, um, but if you're if you're scaling up like manufacturing or I mean they elaborate a little bit more. Um, well, so I think they were specifically looking at uh, like an expanded lab group. So how do you how do you handle enlarging your staff? I guess in a lab enlarging like the staff. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's I, I mean they grow and shrink. The companies you know they'll grow and shrink. Um, and I think it's more of when, as the company grows, so do the buildings. Mm -hmm. And um, I know, you know, there's a lot of space will be like repurposed for something else. It'll change. You'll, start, you'll have a lab that switches. Um, and uh, for us, it was that's when that's when the whole thing it was actually right before I joined um, the labs. We used to have a separate uh, development lab. And, GMP lab and then everything became that, that GMP space just to make things easier mm -hmm. uh, and it just depends on what the needs are I think within the company right and right, right. as you start to you know where, where the funding is coming from so if they're telling trying to grow your department mm -hmm. uh, and there's more funding then you might want to um, like uh, for example we we started to do a lot of oral products and uh, on our site, and this was before Avi came. Um, and so we had to build up a dissolution lab for, right. for people to do dissolution uh, testing and, and dissolution like re research on, on these tablets. And um, 
So, you know, it was like an old space that was kind of repurposed and then built up. So kind of like expanding, you know, where the lab space, whereas, you know, there was another lab recently where we had to, I had to move out of mass spec from there because like the other group needed that space. So we had, a, so it's kind of like you're moving all things around and, and, and you'll typically have groups that kind of coordinate that. Um, so if you're expanding from something small to larger, like if you're renting a bigger building or, um, you know, if you're, if you're growing, I think you just, mm -hmm. from there, you kind of just um, scale up what your processes already are. Um, and then it just depends on whether or not you're bringing in that, that next step. Like if you're going from discovery into development mm, and, right. and at and that point, you just start bringing in people that kind of know um, that, that quality aspect of, of trying to bring a product onto the market. Right. So that, so at that point, really what you're, re what you're really looking for is making sure that you are hiring the right people with the right expertise. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. With the right, with the right backgrounds. Yeah, absolutely. So, so for the, for the general group, are there any resources uh, like applications, books, or anything that you guys have used uh, to plan out your labs or wish you had found <laughs> when you were starting that process? I actually have one. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so it's a web application known as Quartzy, Q-U-A-R-T-Z-Y. I found that very helpful in, uh, it's not as good for doing inventory and planning like inventory, but it is very useful for chemicals. Um, so yeah, Quartzy is very useful for chemicals. I use it all the time. It helps track where you got it from, what you used to purchase it. You can put locations associated with it and even use it for other samples and things like that. So yeah, I would use, I, I definitely use that one because it also helps with maintenance because people can, other people in your lab can just go in and request some new chemicals if they're getting low. So it's very useful for maintenance and can also be used for planning if you use like the request option as like a planning. Cool. Yeah, chemical inventories are very, very important. Even if they're just on paper, I've seen them just on paper, like trying to, where's boral hydride? We're sitting boral hydride, like looking through <laughs> different labs and, I, and, and that saved a lot of time. Uh, a lot of time and it's in it, and it even saves money because like there are other labs that have it. You might just need a little bit of this reagent. Um, you know, uh, th there are times even now where I'll like, I'll have to run to another lab to get a specific reagent. Um, with, with us now in, in industry, we have a, a, you know, everything is managed on and, and tracked and all that stuff. Everything is barcoded and, and kind of stuff like that. It's, it's kind of the way that things are trending, I think. Right. Yeah, we suggest yeah. that people have three types of inventories. One is the equipment inventory. So understand what kind of equipment is available at your institute, um, mm -hmm. available for to share, um, as well as things like booking, like maybe it's just a calendar, a digital calendar of some sort. The second is exactly what uh, Troy and I were talking about was chemical inventory. There's a number <laughs> of different companies that do that. It's great because run, one, right, for sharing, you just in a small quantity, but also tracking expiry dates because mm -hmm. then you know when something's going to expire. And if you see, hey, I'm ordering something in, or this happens to me all the time, you know, you're ordering something, but it's going to take a while to ship, you can go through the inventory, see who has some, that you can then replace. You're taking their short dated stuff and you're giving them some kind of long dated um, replacement. Right. Um, but also just tracking when they expire. And then the last is freezer inventories. So there's a number of companies that do that. A lot of them free for academic use. Um, Freezer inventory is really important because when you open the freezer, all the cold air comes out. And so minimizing that freezer opening time is really important. If you know exactly where your samples are, one, it's good for you to track and know what you have and what you, so you don't reproduce things all the time. Um, but also then you know exactly where you open the door, you go in, grab what you want, and then close back the door right away. And if you track all of that, then that's a huge uh, energy savings that you're going to find. Right. So I always suggest the three types of uh, inventories that you should set up in your lab before your lab even starts. So these should be in place for lab users to use um, when you start your lab. Right. I imagine it is a lot easier to uh, to do that before you start your lab, to set that up before you start your lab. Because I, I mean, I know from personal experience, once you get everything in and then you try to set something, a system like that up, now all of a sudden you have to go back into all of those things. You have to go back into your freezer. You have to pull everything out of your freezer. Uh, so that suffers from a freeze thaw cycle, right? And then, you know, in, in order to re inventory. So if you set these kind of things up ahead of time, like as you're starting, um, the process is kind of a, 
it's kind of, it's kind of a pain, but it, it actually makes it worth your while later, right? I have a question about the, the I've never used it before, but the Quartzy mm -hmm. program. So yeah. is, is everyone in the in that department going to be signed into the same like account so that everyone knows what is going to be like what chemicals are available? Is that how that works? Well, we use it to uh, manage the lab. I, I if you it'd be required some coordination to get everyone involved. But yeah, we use it to manage the lab. Um, and how it works with the lab is you just kind of have your inventory, you make it as you go. So as you get in chemicals, you have to manually input the chemical in to just, uh, you can sort it by, um, basically you, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? You look for the company that gave it to you, you put in the catalog number, it'll pull up everything. And then you go through and fill out all the things like location and expiration date and things like that. And then it'll just have it in there. And then people in your lab can go to your account, search for the chemical, it'll pull up. And if it's running low, they can request the chemical, you get a notification and then you approve an order. The reason I say that is because one of the problems here is like everyone individually is ordering their stuff. And I noticed the first thing I noticed is everyone has like the same things, like, and it's just a waste. So. I was just thinking if that was, if Quartzy is one of those ones where everyone could, you would know what everyone else is doing and that will avoid like that bloating. Yeah, yeah. I really don't want to order anything. And I'm, I'm definitely someone who will just go and use what's there um, to an extent. So. But it's definitely yeah. possible. Like I work at a global company and uh, we use not Quartzy, we use a, a competitor to Quartzy, I guess. Um, and um, so there, you know, we can actually see, I can see what kind of chemicals the, the labs in Singapore have. And I can see what's in the US. I can see what's in Brussels. I can see what's in Egypt. And I can actually see what everybody has. And that takes a amount of coordination, but it's definitely possible. And uh, I've definitely seen universities do it as well, whether you're across, uh, across department as well. So, so, uh, so if you get a chance, Fanny, if you could type into the, uh, to the chat, uh, the name of some of the others. So we have Quartzy up there. Uh, just to give some people some various options, uh, you know, and, how and those and those those, those also track expiry dates, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's really really important, especially in industrial setting. That's it's very 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 important. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. I'm going to say um, Delaware, our environmental health and safety implemented uh, chem inventory, which is similar to Quartzy, although it doesn't have quite as many features. It's just for tracking chemicals as opposed to like Quartzy has extra features like for ordering and things like that. But it has made all the difference that it was implemented at the university level. Because there, yeah, we can actually um, share between labs as long as we give permission so that we can actually see what other labs have in their chemical inventory. If there is something that we need for a specific experiment that we don't need a lot of, right. that something else might have. We can actually share between it and it also lets us yeah do the barcode thing for tracking everything we have mm -hmm. in the lab and that makes a huge difference i know back when i was a lab manager it seemed like every week somebody new in the lab was asking me to order something you know they needed for an experiment it's like well did you go look at the shelf and see mm -hmm. whether we had it <laughs> <laughs> and right. we had it and there we were trying to do a like an excel based master list of all of our chemicals and that only works so well just because right. you need buy in from everybody in the lab yeah right to continue to maintain it so yeah, the, but to to be to be completely fair, the Excel works. Excel works as long as there's only one person managing it. Excel fails as soon as there are two or more people who are all using the, the all using this stuff and not no one's updating the Excel file, right? Exactly. Uh, so <laughs> a, a database works. I really uh, so um, I really like the idea of the barcoding system. I think it's really it's really useful, right? So it, it manages data. You know, it helps you manage the database uh, of your inventories. Um, I can imagine a lot of people who've never done a lot of barcoding think it's a big pain in the butt to uh, to label every bottle, every single tube you get in. Um, but overall, right, it sounds like you guys are all in agreement that the, uh, the barcoding really saves you a lot of wasted time and effort in the long run, right? Yes. I mean, yeah. Well, that's good to know. I hope I hope more people go into barcoding. I always like that. Uh, and. Uh, so thanks for all those equipment and things on the 
on the chat. If anybody's looking for that, there's a nice list of all that. Um, so I had a, a couple of general questions to come back to. Um, like to, you guys are fielding so many questions to me, it's amazing. Uh, so what is one of the biggest challenges you guys have all had to overcome in doing what you're doing, right? What, what's, uh, how is that working? Nobody? Jeremy, what's, what's, all right, go ahead, Fanny. What's, what's, what, what are some of the biggest challenges you've had to overcome starting up the labs? Yeah, I find that some of it has to do with kind of misaligned incentives. So for example, um, you want to buy a freezer that is going to, you know, save more money on energy, for example, but that savings as a PI or, you know, it, it doesn't come to you, right? You spend more money buying that piece of equipment or you spend more money on the more sustainable option, but the kind of benefit goes to some sort of building services somewhere else. And so in, a, in industry, it'll be, it doesn't come on your scorecard, right? It's somebody else's scorecard that it goes on. And um, it's very challenging, that one, because it needs to be solved on an institutional level. So it's not just you and your lab, but you actually have to involve the rest of the institute in order to look at what is best for everyone and not just look at what's best for you as a PI in your lab. And so that for, is, I find a big challenge because you have to work beyond just you. Right. Yeah, I, I'd say, yeah, the, the biggest challenge for me was starting back in January and yeah, being given my pool of startup money and my lab space and no other direction and just go. Oh, yeah. Like I, right. it, going from being, yeah, but postdoc lab manager where you always had a superior to report to who could help point you in the right direction and you know, keep you focused on the work that you needed to do was really big. But when you are starting a new lab as an academic, yeah, you're largely left to your own devices and you have to figure this all out. Wow. And it was even worse this year just because of COVID because we didn't have our office staff present in the building. We didn't, yeah, like I didn't have the interactions with the other labs in the building because most of the other uh, professors weren't coming in on a regular basis. Um, and so, yeah, like having your plan and knowing what to do and sticking to it when you really don't know if you're doing the right thing or not is really nerve wracking. Right. I can imagine. Yeah. Right. And without, without that, 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 uh, that support base. Right. So, so normally, normally there would be a mentor available really quick or just somebody you can go in and ask real fast, Hey, I'm in a situation. What'd you guys do? Right. So yeah. COVID COVID, like in all things, COVID just ruins everything for us, right? Yeah. <laughs> I feel a little bit in the opposite of that. Um, because I didn't get startup funds, I was able to see what we need mm -hmm. um, this whole year. So I've just been walking around every time I propose to do something in a class and we don't have that. I mean, I'm writing down things that I want. So, you know, it, I've been able to start accumulating a list and I've been able to start writing grants to try to get what I want. So um, I think not having the startup funds might have been a blessing slightly to me because I would have been going in kind of like, oh, I want this, even though we might not need that. And I'm, you know, um, so, yeah, so mine is kind of the opposite. Um, there's a lot of things I want to do, but I can't. Right. And, um, and I can't do it immediately. I have to wait until I have the funds to do them. So that's kind of that, um, that's a little bit stressful there. And you yeah. also wanna prepare the students. Like that's another thing is we, um, we're charged with trying to prepare students for what they're gonna be experiencing. So say the students leave this school and they join Jeremy's lab, there, there's a knowledge base that they need to know before they go to Jeremy's lab. And they can't be like all the way at the very bottom <laughs> doing equipment that was used in the 1980s. And then you jump into his lab and it's 2020. <laughs> so that's the kind of dynamic that we're kind of working with here. We're trying to increase the equipment, the level of equipment so that the students are learning what they're going to do in the future. Right. Right. So yeah. <laughs> that's, I can imagine that's a, that's a, that's a hard that's a hard place to be too right because the the technology is always changing yeah 
you know, what, what's being used in the lab is changing, you know, every, every year or two, right? I'm sure everyone here has used a nanodrop, right? Mm -hmm. So we yeah. don't have a nanodrop. Oh, no. We, we only have, we have the old school mass spec. I mean, the, the old mass specs where they have the cuvettes. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're behind so and we haven't even, I mean, there's like, there's been about five different nanodrops by now. So we haven't even had the first one. Right. So I'm just saying like, those are kind of things I'm seeing and I'm writing down as things that we need to upgrade for the future. Uh, Bradford assay is way more accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. To the, yeah, I can do the Bradford in biochem, but yeah, because yeah, it's the wavelengths high enough. Yeah, the nano right. drop is a, is a, is a game changer. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 although it is it is nice for at a certain point in time, Torrance, to give to give your students that this is where it used to be. And then when they go to somebody's uh, much more, much more um, money friendly lab, they can go, Oh my God, this is wonderful. <laughs> Trust me, they did yeah. that in biochemistry. We made our, we made the polyacrylamide gels, but we had oh. the old, we had the old uh, clamp, uh, clamp cassettes, not the new ones that BioRad has where you put them on a little slide and they clip on. We had the ones that you had to jam in and jam in and yeah. So they got, they got to do it. <laughs> it was just ah. older equipment. Ah. And I had done oh, that before awesome. too, so it was cool. Well, that's I think there's that's a lot cool. of appreciation. I think there's a lot of appreciation when 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 you do do things like that, and then you you jump into a lab that has that has it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say <laughs> that when I was. Oh. Go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Still actually really useful for my lab because I still run large sequencing gels because we do a lot of RNA work. Mm -hmm. So being able to pour polyacrylamide gels is a. Uh, very useful skill. Just yeah. to yeah. have, so it, it really is. I mean, I can't. I can't count the number of times where somebody said, "Well, have you ever done this?" And I said, "Well, I'm sure I did that in a lab in undergrad." They're like, "Well, do it again." And I'm like, "Oh no!" <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, was, that, oh, I was just going to mention the, that was that was very similar to where uh, you know I used to pack my own columns. Mm. always pack my own columns and then when i got to industry and they have combi flashes and hplcs and columns everywhere you look and you know and it's just like i but i'm, I'm glad because you learn a little bit more about the theory of what's going on when you sure. start when you start really diving into kind of the primitive technology <laughs> right. right all right well we're coming up on the hour uh so i just want to ask one more question uh from each of you in turn uh and we've kind of touched upon this a little bit uh in the conversation so um so the last question i have for everybody is how do you actually estimate that overall budget right so we either like jeremy like you were given a starting money or torrance you didn't have any money to start with how do you start estimating a, a budget around and what do you learn to watch for what are the hidden things uh, and i know uh, fanny you've mentioned a lot of those little hidden costs right uh, how do you manage those things and what do you what do you watch out for I mean, for me, yeah, the big thing in terms of equipment costs is I do maintain a, a master spreadsheet of everything I've purchased so that I actually can go through it year by year and see how much exactly I've been spending for that year just on equipment. So I did this as a lab manager in my previous lab and now keeping it up with my new lab. So you have a sense of what, yeah, and that would include everything from, yeah, like, tips that you buy for the lab, as well as service costs. If yeah, your FPLC is broken and you have to have somebody out and it costs $7,000 for them to fix it. Like all of those little things have to be in that master list. The other thing, at least for me, like being in an academic lab um, with our startup funds, we're also expected to pay the people in our, who are going to be working in our labs for our graduate students, possible postdocs, lab techs, that kind of thing. Um, so it's really important to, communicate with your administrator so you know the exact cost of how much a person is going to cost you for mm -hmm. a year of work because um, there's a lot of little hidden things there as well um, like indirect costs so you know the the cost of providing them health insurance and, all, and benefits and things um, that you have to pay on top of their salary that aren't always uh, evident to begin with um, 
and it gets complicated. Grad students can be on TA ships, so the university will be paying them for a semester. Um, whereas, yeah, like, you know, you will still be expected to pay them for summers. And yeah, so having people explain exact costs to you ahead of time so that you can then sit down with what your pool of money is and say, okay, I expect I'm going to spend this much on this area, this much on that. And then making sure you build a buffer into it as well is really, really important because you never know when something's going to break and you have to replace it. Um, so, yeah. right. And I, and I, and I, and if I can hit on, so it sounds almost like what you're saying is like for maybe like, if you know that you're going to be starting, I mean, your goal is to start a new lab. Uh, eventually, right? Maybe not this year, maybe next year, or maybe in the next two years, right? As you're finishing your postdoc and you're looking at that, one of the one of the things that I imagine that, you, like you said, you were doing as a lab manager is you start documenting how much you're using different instruments and you really kind of keeping track is like, okay, this is an instrument that I, act, that I use 75% of the time during the week. This is an instrument I have to have in my new lab, right? Uh, versus some other instruments, maybe they don't get used very often. Maybe they only get used once a month or whatever. And maybe that's not an instrument that you need right away. That's one uh, that you can put off or find a shared. Uh, yeah, a colleague library. that you can borrow it from. Yeah. Right, right. From the Anybody? teaching um, college perspective, um, you have to think about it as the, the students are what are driving like the what the university is making. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, like we are considering here moving into a biotechnology, having a biotechnology major. So in order to do that, we need some stuff, right? So I'm driving home that if you want students here, then you have to provide them with the right stuff in order to be successful, right? right. So it's kind of using that um, leverage of bringing in more students for major and you getting the equipment that you need in the lab for them and for you. So it's kind of like, it's cause I don't have that, I don't have startup funds. I have actually the university's funding as my, as like to my disposal differently, you know, it's in right. a different way. So this is kind of something to think about if you're in a teaching university, you have to, tell them why this cost is going to benefit the university and one student you know is bringing in twenty thousand dollars so that's any that's you know that's a lot of equipment that you can get so it's kind of like right. that kind of cost to benefit thing that you have to drive home one more hidden cost i'd like to add if that's okay sure absolutely um, is, uh, is like i think that a lot of people, when they're going into a lab, the lab is already somewhat built. The construction company has already built it, and um, you know things like fume hoods or autoclaves and or drying cabinets are already in there. And um, this is a problem that I see because it would be better if we were able to actively kind of input on that equipment because there have been mm -hmm. a lot of cases where the construction company will put in things that are maybe of uh, the cheapest one they can possibly find. Right. And for you, that means that's going to be a cost for you very soon. So you need to make sure it's of good quality, fit for purpose, and also very energy efficient because usually the cheapest one will actually then hit your energy bill later. And right. um, that's a good what point. the type of fume hood you have, is it a, a variable error uh, volume one or a constant one? Right. And if you know this in advance and if you're able to input in this, that's great. If not, you might end up getting the cheapest one that's going to cost you later. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. It's like, uh, I, I don't know how often you, you get that kind of input, but I mean, I can imagine that uh, that kind of input is really valuable. Troy, what about you? Any any tips, any uh, ideas on how to watch that budget? Well, sadly, I'm not the best person to ask because ah, ah. I'm not in charge of the budget. I have two PIs and they have massive startup funds that I actually share between them. So we have a bunch of money to spend right now. Oh, that's a, uh, that's a wonderful problem to have. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we have, uh, I will say that um, if you are working with students or inexperienced individuals, I will say to make a bigger buffer because I'd like a buffer of a budget because mm -hmm. Glass, glassware will break. Um, right. People will order the wrong primers. People will make miscalculations and use a lot of chemicals needlessly. It'll happen, especially with inexperienced individuals. So if you're in teaching or um, academic, I would make a, 
a much bigger buffer. Now, now in the, in, the, in the academic labs, so when I was in, when I was in academic labs, if I broke the glass, I had to pay for it. Are you, are oh. you saying the labs all get to, all have to pay for that, or you don't put yeah, that onto we the pay students? For that. <laughs> yeah, oh, we what? Pay for that now. Oh my gosh, you should forward that onto the students. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right, Eric, what about you? Any ideas? Um, for the financial part here uh, in industry, I don't know too much about how we budget. Um, I know it's, I know more about like budgeting for projects and things mm -hmm. like that than, than budgeting for the lab. Um, but I think that what everybody said was, is this something that I've experienced in the past. Um, one thing I was doing was I would try to find like sometimes the, not necessarily the cheapest, but like, so yeah, it goes with secondhand, but like I would find, um, you know, glassware, just like no name brand glassware, um, right. which, you know, may not be the best at times, but you know, sometimes it's going to break. And I know with teaching labs, it's, it's going to break. Right. Uh, and then just being very, very, careful with what you do have <laughs> right and then uh, for for all of you guys one last question that came through um so if you had funds or if you were given funds uh, and you didn't use those funds to buy the equipment you decide to share you know you don't you don't need to buy this piece of equipment right off the bat what happens to those funds do you get the do they stay in your account or do they go back to whatever uh whatever place gave it to you in the first place I, I know with yeah, it being in the university setting, usually the university will want that money back after a while. So with Delaware, I have five years to spend the startup money that they've given me. Um, it was a similar situation at Rutgers for the uh, professors there. So that means if you don't use that money, and so that money's for not only just equipment and lab supplies, but also for fund, uh, paying people in your lab as well. Right. So if it doesn't get used within that five-year period, like it, it goes back to the university and you no longer have it anymore. So it is, yeah, important to actually spend it and use it because it is funds that's available to you. Right, right. And it's not worth leaving it on the table when it's something you can use to forward your research, forward your program, or maybe, yeah, buy yourself that nicer instrument, that nano drop, or, um, yeah, something along those lines. And that, that's been a, yeah, a, a trade off that, I've had trouble with too is sometimes you spend too long fretting over whether you should buy something and you end up actually costing yourself more in the long run because you haven't gotten that equipment or you know whatever item into the lab soon enough so that people can start using it and you know you would have had productivity over that period of time you spent fretting whether you should have bought it or not right. so right well, everybody, I appreciate uh, it's just over an hour. Um, I appreciate all the conversations. Uh, you guys have been great. Um, thanks everybody for uh, giving in your comments and all everybody for watching who gave in your awesome questions. I hardly had to hit mine at all. Uh, so uh, I appreciate everybody. Um, again, this uh, webinar will be uh, recorded and will be uh, allowed for viewing access to anybody who signed up. Uh, so if you have anybody who's interested, uh, let, let us know at Gold Bio, and we'll forward you the uh, the take. All right. All right. Well, excellent. Well, thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. You guys all have a good, good day. Thanks. Thank you. Nice Thank you. to meet you guys. Nice. Bye. nice to meet all of you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.